introduce myself and talk about how I first met Patrick Stanick. Well, I'm Summer Kendrell. Patrick Stanick was in the very first show I saw at the Little Theater. It was two or three years ago, so a pretty long time. The play was, what's the one about the guy whose first wife is dead, but he's remarried now. Then they have a seance and that brings back the ghost of his first wife. Is it like blighted spirits? Anyway, Patrick Stanick played the neighbor, the doctor next door. After the show, I shook hands with the cast in the lobby and it got me thinking, I should try out for that season's musical. I got the part. Yay! <laughs> I guess you could say Patrick Stanick inspired me to start doing shows. Well, not him alone. The whole cast, but sort of him, I guess. Hello, I'm Peggy Post. There's a good chance that Patrick and I are the oldest of the old timers at the Little Theater. He and I both grew up here in Marmoset and I was very sorry to learn of his passing. Gosh, when did we first meet? I know we played husband and wife over and over. The last time was Blythe Spirit. The first time, was he Brick and I was Maggie, cat on a hot tin roof? <laughs> oh well, Patrick was a very nice man and he'll be missed. He's in a better place, and he never had a bad thing to say about anyone. Except for the bartender down at the ugly mug. For some reason, he always complained about the bartender at the ugly mug, which is strange because I recall Pat saying that this fellow introduced him to his wife. Well, his ex-wife now. <laughs> I'm Jake Lavelle. Call me Jake. I first met Patrick Stanick seven years ago when my family and I moved down from Wichita. Uh, he and I met while building the staircase for arsenic and old lace. He had some funny stories. Liked to sail. Knew every old movie ever made. and He devoted 50 years of his life to the theater. That counts for a lot, right? Now, not everyone enjoyed working with him, but I mean, you could say that about... Yeah, it could be difficult to get along with Patrick Stanick. For instance, he was a cheapskate, unapologetically a cheapskate. Every show, we all chip in to buy a gift for the director, but not him. Still, 50 years, <laughs> that's a lot of years. Joy Elkins. I first met Patrick when he did sound design for On Golden Pond. I directed. Now I have a very simple take when it comes to sound design. Sound effects and music are invisible. Sound designers should be too. You just read the script and go do what you do. Bring back sound. Easy. Pond asks for a lot of loon calls. I don't know what Patrick brought back. Uh, cattle lowing, goats bleating, wolves howling. <laughs> well, we eventually got it all worked out, but I, I found that Patrick's strong suit was acting in small roles. I cast him as a cop in Dial M for murder. Enter, take prop, exit. He did fine at that. Second question. What are my experiences with sharing the stage with Patrick? Actually, I've never been on stage with him, but I do have an experience I can share. It was during the drowsy chaperone and we had just finished rehearsal. We'd gathered around for director's notes and he waved me over. He didn't want to say this in front of the others. Said it was good that I was using my hands to express myself, 
but that I should avoid doing something you never see in real life. Someone showing off the palms of their hands as they talk. Look, you can tell how sincere and emotional I am. I'm showing you my palms. And he was completely right. It looks stupid. That got me really thinking about how I use my body on stage. How a particular character would stand or walk or use their hands. So I think more like an actor now. Yay. As I said, Pat and I played husband and wife in who knows how many shows. We developed a rapport on stage, kind of how married couples do in real life. Oh, not that there was, <clears throat> I mean, nothing ever. <laughs> oh, golly. Ooh. What I mean to say is, you know how someone can be your coworker for years, but you never really know them? Patrick and I were co-players, so to speak, but I never really re know. <laughs> um, let me say something nicer. <laughs> okay, there's a rule in theater that as soon as your cue ends, you say your next line. This keeps the dialogue crisp, snappy. Heavens to Betsy, Pat was an expert at that. Even as we grew older and struggled a bit to remember our lines, we still had that snappy rapport. <laughs> he used to compare us to Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy. He loved old movies about as much as he loved a sailboat. Those must have been his two great passions, I think. Those and the theater. Pat and I were doing a Neil Simon play together. I forget which one, they all kinda... Never mind. On the one hand, he was always at every rehearsal. He was good at learning his lines. On the other hand, maybe he was a little bit too good at learning dialogue because he also knew everyone else's line. And whenever there was the slightest pause, Patrick would charge ahead and Finish the other actor's line so he could say his own. Sometimes I would pause for dramatic effect and he would BAM! Finish my line so he could say his own. It was very distracting. And if I'm honest, pretty damn rude. Maybe it was that old school of thought that lines need to be delivered BAM 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 without any gaps in between. I never agreed with that, but he never did it during any actual performances, only rehearsals. So, there's that. As I say, I quickly learned it was best to cast Patrick in small parts, so my experience of it on stage is minimal. One incident does come to mind, though. Now. It is as true in community theatre as in professional. An actor does not tell another actor how to act. It would be like an actor telling a lighting designer how to light, or a sound designer how to... Don't get me started on sound designers. Well, I was directing Drowsy Chaperone, and Mr. Stanick had the audacity to advise one of my actors on the appropriate manner of gesturing. It's the director's job. That is why I am called the director. <laughs> Come to think of it, he wasn't even involved in that show. I don't know why he started attending rehearsals. Third question. Share my experiences with Patrick backstage. One time, he showed up in the green room during intermission. Maybe he had been working in the box office or something. He was telling a story about a fire they once had in the theater during a show. Not a big fire, but they had to evacuate the building. Turns out, fire trucks were all in the way, so the audience was stuck, hanging out around their cars in the parking lot. The play was a murder mystery, and everyone was left wondering who the culprit was. Patrick 
had the idea they should perform the final act right there in the parking lot. And that's what they did. And yay, the audience loved it. And by the time the fire trucks were gone, the murderer was revealed and nobody asked for a refund. <laughs> Hope I have a story like that to tell one day. Not a fire in the middle of a show. I don't make, but something good like that. Patrick backstage. Back when we were younger, he used to, well, many of us used to drink a bit too much at cast parties. <laughs> I remember one story he told me, and this will give you an idea of what a character he was. He had gone over to Ponca Playhouse to see a show that he had been in the previous season. Unfortunately, the lead actor there had been arrested, and like us, they don't have understudies. So the gentleman who handles refreshments read the part straight out of the script book, while the other actors guided him around the set. Now Patrick, being Patrick, said the man in charge of refreshments didn't do a very good job on stage, but he wound up getting a standing ovation. Patrick found this fascinating. <laughs> he realized that he wouldn't have to bother memorizing an entire part if they made some excuse at the start of the show about why he couldn't be there. Then he could be introduced to someone else and just read out of the script. <laughs> he had it all worked out. He even had a fake name ready. <laughs> Sam something. That's it. Sam Lafane. Capital L-E, capital F-A-N-E. Fane. Like when, when you feign being happy to see someone you don't really like but spell differently. In fact, Sam Lafane is an anagram. Switch the letters around and it spells false name. Oh, oh mercy, he had given this a lot of thought. <laughs> of course, it was just a bunch of jibber jabber. He never really did it. Did I mention that he wasn't the only one who drank a bit too much at those cast parties? And he drank less as he got older. When we were waiting for the show to start during that Neil Simon play, Pat and I would uh, talk about old movies. He told me that his favorite Orson Welles movie was The Stranger. It's an odd choice, so I asked him why not Citizen Kane? Now you probably know Citizen Kane opens with the death of Charles Foster Kane and the rest of the movie is a reporter interviewing people trying to piece together what Kane was really like. And none of the perspectives fit together and even the one piece of the puzzle that might have finally explained Kane goes up in smoke at the end. Pat said that bothered him. He thought it should be more like Sunset Boulevard, which also opens with the death, but that guy gets to narrate his story from beyond the grave. Pat wanted Citizen Kane to end with the ghost of Kane rising from the grave and making sense of his life. <laughs> I guess he was kidding. My interaction with Patrick backstage was also minimal. I can say this. We were performing Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap. We were using a smoke machine to create a fog effect outside the windows. And irony of ironies, the machine caused an electrical short which sparked a fire. For the first 10 and 12 minutes, we just thought the machine was working especially well. <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, it was Patrick who realized that, no, the theater was on fire. Well, it was controlled chaos. We eventually got it all worked out. I can say I was grateful to have Patrick Stanick acting as a stagehand that night. Hmm. You know, what makes this all the more noteworthy is that the fire caused considerable damage, so much that we almost had to close the theater. Uh, fortunately, a generous donor, uh, uh, Mr. Samuel Lafayne, donated the entire $9,000 needed to keep us afloat. Oh. 
But that's irrelevant, isn't it? <laughs> Let's edit that out. Wait. Samuel Fane. Take a moment. Question. What can you say about Patrick outside of the theater? <clears throat> I'm pretty new there. Sad to say I didn't really know him that well. There are a lot of theater folks I don't know at all. I don't think I have met the person who sent this email. Sorry! I hope I've given you something you can use in your movie. Now. If you need any music to go along with it, I am available. Of course, you'll have to arrange that with my agent. Thank you so very much. My fondest memory of Patrick outside the theater is the time he took me sailing. It was several months after my husband died in a fencing accident. Oh, how silly of me, not sword fighting. He was installing a safety fence along the top of a steep edge out at the quarry. As he was double checking it, well, you can imagine the rest. <clears throat> okay, I'm back. <laughs> Several months afterward, Patrick offered to take me sailing. It was very relaxing, perfect weather, exactly what I needed. Other than that, we really haven't socialized at all outside of the theater. I know that Patrick later sold that boat. I asked him why, and all he said was, it was time. But he was quite the character and very mindful of money. He did boast that he'd managed to get $9,000 for it. I don't know, is that a good price for a used sailboat? I suppose his reason for selling it must forever remain a mystery. Well, at least I might have figured out why he so disliked the bartender at the ugly mug. Outside the theater. All that comes to mind isn't particularly flattering, but hey, we're all human, right? A couple of months ago, a month or two ago, he and I ran into each other at the ugly mug, and we got to talking about old movies. One topic led to the other, and I asked him to tell me about the time there was a fire in the theater, because it was before I moved to Marmoset. You know, he told me that he had been the one who first discovered the fire and that it had been his idea to finish the play in the parking lot when the fire trucks had him blocked in anyway. I have no reason to doubt any of this. So he finishes his story and he gets up and goes to the bathroom. Now he hadn't been drinking that much. You know, old men. Anyway, the bartender had overheard our conversation and he told me that one night back when Patrick drank a lot more, he had come in one night and confessed to starting that fire. Apparently he had forgotten to put fluid in the smoke machine before the show, so he did it during the show, while the machine was on in the dark. Spilled some fluid, electrical short, fire in the theater, it could have happened to anyone, I suppose. But why not own up to it? It's not like he was some fugitive Nazi war criminal like in The Stranger, that Orson Welles movie. Why cast himself as the hero? As I said, it could be a challenge to get along with Patrick Stanek. Very sorry. It hadn't clicked that you're the one who emailed us, Mr. Lefane. May I call you Sam? I certainly would enjoy meeting such a devoted patron of the little theater. I... Let me, um, 
finish this final segment for you, sir. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I can speak to what Patrick was like outside of the theater. We didn't fraternize, and for that I'm sorry. Maybe I would have understood him better if we had found some reason to socialize with one another. So, instead of a more fitting answer to your final question, let me end with this, well-worn though it be. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, etc., etc., until the final scene. We really must do more Shakespeare at the Little Theatre. Despite the sorrowful loss of Patrick Stanick, the show goes on, as it must. Yes, I know it's you who asked us to make these videos, Patrick. You might not remember telling me about your false name idea, but I do. Sam LaFane. And tell me, what did you think about my performance here? Always giving me mean notes, thinking you're a better actor than anybody. <laughs> oh, you are such a character. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs>